Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this evening's webinar from writer to creator featuring dead to me creator Liz Feldman. My name is Faye Wolf. I am a College of Fine Arts graduate. I am based in Los Angeles where I am an artist, primarily a singer songwriter, an author and also a decluttering pro. So welcome to tonight, which is sponsored by the Boston University As Alumni Association and is offered to our 339,000 alumni across the globe. Before we begin, I would like to welcome the over 250 alumni joining us for this webinar, including members of the BU community joining us from all over the world, including places like London, Los Angeles, Chicago, Beijing, Boston, Cincinnati, New York, Mumbai, Phoenix, Rome, and many, many more. We are so glad to have you with us tonight. To go over a few housekeeping notes before we begin, tonight's webinar is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them throughout the discussion by typing them into the Q&A box. To find the Q&A box, just put your mouse over your Zoom screen to reveal the toolbar at the bottom, then select Q&A, and we will do our very best to get to as many questions as we can. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce fellow alumni and College of Communications graduate Liz Feldman. Liz has been a writer and producer on hit shows, including The Ellen DeGeneres Show, to Broke Girls and Hot in Cleveland, and she created the NBC comedy One Big Happy, as well as the Emmy and Golden Globe nominated Netflix hit, Dead to Me. Liz, it is so great to have you here. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Faye, that's such a nice introduction, and it is, it's so nice to be here. It's, uh, we met, we met at BU. We did, we sure did. We did, we were roommates in college. How have you been since then? Oh, you know, <laughs> just doing a little of this and that. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have remained the closest of friends yes, throughout many, many years. Thank you, BU. So to start us off, Liz, we are here to talk about your journey from writer to creator, but let's start, I know you want to talk a little bit about the journey of becoming a writer itself because you were a lot of other things and then it was sort of directed towards writing. So where would you like to start there? So I'll, I'll start by saying that, you know, I always knew I wanted a career in entertainment and specifically comedy. And to that effect, I started doing stand up at the age of 16 and uh, also doing improv uh, on the side and, you know, just, just loving all things comedy, but specifically comedy performing. And uh, it was through doing stand up that I actually got pointed in the direction of writing for the first time, which is uh, happened when, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I was a kid comedian, which is a little weird. You know, there aren't that many of us. Yeah, it's a little weird. I was, I was 16 and I'm like writing jokes about my mom and you know, my experience with like the SATs and oh, crazy. <laughs> and and uh, there were other kid comedians also, oddly. And I uh, started writing jokes for them. Um, you know, That's we all had the same manager, isn't that weird? Okay. And this is in you know, New York, he, this is in New York. I'm from okay. Brooklyn, and right. you know, I would like ride the subway to Manhattan and like do these shows. And we had this manager named Sid Gold, and he asked me if I'd start punching up the other kids' jokes. And again, this isn't like something I ever was like, yes, one day I'm gonna right. punch up jokes for nine year olds. That's mm -hmm. what I want to do. But I started doing it. And uh, one night we were doing a show and Nickelodeon uh, people were there, like some scouts from, from their casting. And uh, they, they asked my manager like, hey, who, who writes her material? And you know, he was like, she does. And it turns out they were looking for a writer performer for their show called All That, which is actually, I think now back on the air, but this was in 1995, oh. mm -hmm. so a few years right. ago. Mm -hmm. um, I was 18 years old, just like a few weeks out of high school. And again, writing for television wasn't really something I like had you know, been dreaming about. I really wanted to be on TV. So you know, I took the opportunity, of course. I didn't end up going to, to college. I was supposed to go to Vassar, 
Mm. Boy, would my life have been so different if so different. that was, you know, the sliding door I had taken. Um, and I, I withdrew from Vassar, moved to Orlando, Florida, and, and started writing for this show and performing on the show. Wow. And, you know, I, I tell that story as a, as a way of, you know, sort of showing that sometimes your plans for yourself are kind of interrupted by, let's call it the universe's plans for you. Right. And, um, you know, I had a very specific goal in mind. You know, I wanted to be a, a, a character actor. I wanted to be on SNL. And, you know, the world sort of kept saying to me, like, you you should think about writing for other people. You should mm -hmm. really think about that. And, you know, I kind of, you know, started to follow that encouragement. And that is really how I became a writer, you know, not because it was in my heart of hearts, but it was because it was as if the path was unfolding for me. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And so you lived in Orlando, Florida. Yeah. Then, so, yeah. <laughs> so weird. Um, and then, of course, BU happened. You didn't stay in that job for a long time. You. I didn't. I didn't. I um, came to BU so, to study. So I came to BU, um, and and it's a weird story of even how I ended up at BU. Uh, Dan Fogler, who graduated in ninety eight, I think that's correct, or class of ninety eight, and he and I had gone to high school together. He's now an actor um, of of, right. of renown yes. and Great fantastic renown. beasts, beasts, and um, other things. And anyway, he was my best friend in high school. And when I got uh, when I was done with uh, uh, all that, it was like the middle of the school year. It was I think it was like October, November, or something like that, of what would have been my freshman year of college. So instead of hanging out at my house with my parents, I would go hang out with Dan at BU. And I'd met all his friends. And, you know, one weekend I was there, I think it was for his birthday. He was like, hey, I'm going to audition for this improv group uh, on campus. It's called Spontaneous Combustion. And I was like, of course, that's what it's called. Mm. And because, you know, it's a college improv group. It, it has to have a name like that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but, you know, he was like, you should come to the audition. And I was like, but I don't, I don't go to school here. And he's like, they don't need to know. So sure enough, band. I went, I know, classic band. <laughs> We went to this audition together and had like such a blast. And, you know, they, the, 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 the folks that were running the audition who were the students that were already in the group, they were like, um, you know, you could be in this group if you went to school here, but we can't, uh, like, we're not allowed to right. put you in the group if you're not a student at BU. And I thought about it for like four seconds and the next day I literally walked into the admissions office at BU. I asked to like meet with a counselor. I sat and I filled out uh, an application and I got like my transcript set and uh, sent and, you know, did like an interview and I, I got in and I started going to BU in January, really just to be in the improv group. <laughs> this is fantastic. And what an improv, <laughs> seriously though, SpawnCom was ahead of its time. It Thank was, you. It was it was a pretty was amazing it. group. Yeah, we had yeah. some really talented people who are are great comedic actors and writers to this day. So amen, amen. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So okay. So then you're you're writing. You're you're learning at Column. I don't know if you want to go into that, but you then, as I recall, moved directly to Los Angeles. <laughs> right. Yeah. After so, you graduated. So well, what's funny is that when I when I got to BU, I didn't even know that they had a school of communications. I didn't know that there was a television major that was all like blew my mind when I found out. And I found out from my friend Jason Allen, who was in the school of communication and in Sponcom mm -hmm. in our improv group. And he literally I, I remember the moment he told me he was majoring in television. And I was like, shut up. That's not you can't that can't be a thing parents would spend one hundred thousand dollars on. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and sure enough, it was, and yeah. sure enough, my parents did. And mm -hmm. I did, I, I switched my major from English because, you know, I, I just started that way. Cause you know, right. it feels like a good kind of template course. for something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I went to the, uh, the uh, comm and I, I majored in television and, you know, took some great classes and definitely started to hone some writing skills and took a sitcom writing class and felt like maybe I had a knack for that. And, uh, and they, uh, I think we were the first year that they were offering this pilot program where, where they would um, 
sort of not quite send you out to LA, but like, you know, we got a group together to go to LA and they introduced us to like all these alumni mm. in LA, like, you know, different producers. And I remember we got to be like on the set of a TV show and it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they connected us with, with people that could really help who had gone to BU. And sure enough, I ended up getting an internship and uh, that summer between, I think it was my junior and senior year uh, at BU, I, I moved to LA for the summer to sort of try it out. And I interned for uh, an alumni uh, for a production company that is no longer, but you know, I was so glad to get my start with them. And, um, and that's when I started taking classes at the Groundlings, right. uh, which is a comedy school out in, in Los Angeles uh, that trains a lot of you know, people that you've heard of, it's sort of a bit of a yes. pipeline to SNL and- That's right. Um, yeah, and, and that was sort of my next major step. Okay, and, and of course, honing your skills there, but also meeting people who are still to this day within the industry and, you know- Yeah, exactly. So, collaborate so with. it's, I think that is so sort of vital is like those relationships that you make, especially early on, because it's generally coming from such a pure place when you connect with somebody creatively. Right. Um, and, you know, you know, for example, you know, one of the writers on Dead to Me, not to skip ahead, mm -hmm. is one of my other roommates from college, Kelly That's Hutchinson. Right. You know, and she was actually an acting major and came to writing, you know, later in, in her in her life, in her 30s. Not that that's like so late, but, <laughs> so late you know, but, but later in life, she's 93. <laughs> God bless her. Um, but no, she, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it is so much about, you know, relationships and it is um, incredibly meaningful when you get to work with people that you have this history with. Um, so I really got to hone some some lovely uh, deep connections at the Groundlings. And, you know, and I was in the company with such incredible people like, you know, Kristen Wiig and Dax Shepard and Caitlin Olson, to name a few, um, Annie Mumolo, uh, just, just like such an incredible group of people and, um, you know, and, and inspiring, like such talented people. And, and, and at the Groundlings too, like I, I sort of started to get this encouragement of like, you're, it's you're, you're, you can write for other people like it's like right. some you're good at writing characters and you're you know and, and you know I, I paid attention to that and I started to sort of collect my scripts together and the, the truth is at that time in like my mid-20s I still really wanted to be a performer I it, it was it was my passion and it, it did seem like on like just like more fun and, you know, and, and, and it was fun. And I did start to act and get some jobs and, um, and do a recurring role here and a guest star here. And, you know, I was around 25, 26. And I remember, like, I had what I thought should be a pretty great year as an actor. And I was working in a restaurant also, you know, hostessing, by the way, with Faye. With me. I, was, I also together. hosted at that restaurant. We've <laughs> <laughs> led just parallel lives basically yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um pretty much and uh <laughs> and i'm like hmm, i'm like working as an actor and you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm hostessing and um can barely pay my rent and i just yeah. I, there has got to be some other way to like thrive you know mm -hmm. and i sort of looked inside myself and i was like you know what i'm a writer and i should lean into that you know yeah. because maybe if i do that i you know, won't have to stand on my feet eight hours a day, leading extremely rich people to eat mm -hmm. very rich food. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sat down with my manager at the time, who is still my manager to this day, Christy Smith. And mm -hmm. I said to her, you know, I've resisted it for a really long time, but I think I think I need to be a writer. And I here I've put all these sketches together that I wrote at the Groundlings. Uh, along with some other, you know, different little bits of writing I had done. And I'm, I was like, see what, see what you can do with this. And, you know, again, just sort of going with like the, the sort of flow of, of, of encouragement and what the universe was sort of showing me is that truly three weeks later, I had my first job writing for television, which was on a show called uh, Blue Collar TV. Mm -hmm. Right. Or I guess it was my second job, but my first job, you know, right, in LA. Right. And it, I couldn't, help but notice sort of how relatively easy it was. Not that it is easy for everyone. I think I got really lucky. It was during a time where the, the show had to hire a woman. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they had no females on the on the staff, and I think they got in like a like a wee bit of trouble, mm -hmm. and they quickly had to fill that role. And I think it was a right time, right place situation, and I they hired me. And um, you know, it really it was a it was a job that in so many ways I was not at all appropriate for. You know, it was uh, blue collar TV was Jeff Foxworthy and Larry the Cable Guy's sketch comedy show set in the deep south. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a gay Jew from Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't necessarily think like, oh yeah, well that's a fit. Good for but, them. Um, good for them. Good for them, right? <laughs> yeah. And it, honestly, like it, it was a, it was a great job, and I, I'm, I'm so grateful, you know, for them uh, hiring me. And it was in that job that I was like, this is what I'm gonna do. This is what I, I am, I am a writer, and, and I, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do it to the best of my ability. This is so great that also in that job with the kind of content that you probably wouldn't write, choose right. to write, that even in that you were like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, it was weird. Like, I, and honestly, part of it was the element of being able to support myself and, mm -hmm. and seeing that there was a real, you know, a real thriving, you know, that could happen yeah. if I was a writer. I, you know, I think some people are honestly better suited for struggle. You know, people, mm -hmm. some people, I think some artistic people, and when I say struggle, it can be any kind of struggle. You know, some people don't mind, you know, sort of roughing it out and eating ramen until they get their big break, even if their yeah. big break comes, you know, a little bit later in life. And I think I just wasn't that guy. I really didn't, I didn't, I wanted to I just, I think maybe because I started so young, I was like, no, I really want to, I really want to feel like I'm doing something. I want to feel successful and I want to feel like I'm fulfilling potential. Right. And I felt when I stepped into the role of writer that I, I was doing that. Yeah. You were doing what you were meant to be doing. Yeah. I felt that I did. Yeah. And, and, um, and I, I liked it. It wasn't, it didn't feel like a chore. You know, when I, when I worked on Nickelodeon way back in the day, like it was a, it was a really tough situation and I was really young and I had no idea what I was doing. I was a teenager, you know, and I, I, the only thing I had ever written was like a essay to try to get into college, let, you know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, I had never written on a TV show right. and, you know, it was overwhelming and, you know, there were other elements that made it a very difficult job, including some sexual harassment that was happening, mm -hmm. targeted at me again, the only female writer. And it was discouraging, you know, so I don't, I don't blame myself for sort of having that long pause before I found my way back to writing. I think everything happens for a reason in that way. But once I found my way back to it, I really pretty quickly realized like, if I'm gonna do this, I wanna do this in a way that feels authentic to me mm -hmm. so that I am not just writing sketches, you know, through a lens that I don't necessarily connect with or right. even agree with sometimes, you know? So then so, is, is that when, forgive me, is that when even more Amazing Universe things happened and then you ended up writing for someone you greatly <laughs> admired for decades? I love, I love how subtle you're being. Um, <laughs> that that came right up. It's, it's, it's amazing to be moderated by somebody that knows every single thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> No big deal. No big deal. No big deal. I don't even have to look um, at the notes. <laughs> I feel very seen and understood by you. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I, I'm a gay woman and, and uh, somebody I had always really admired and really dreamed about uh, working with was Ellen DeGeneres. And it seemed really far away when I was a teenager in Brooklyn and, you know, she was like on the tonight show, like what? Um, but all of a sudden here I am in LA and she's now got a talk show. And I was such a nerd that, a nerd specifically for Ellen, mm -hmm. that when her talk show started, I didn't even, I don't even think I had like an agent at the time. And I would sit at home, it was a, day, it's a daytime show. I'd sit at home in the daytime and I would practice writing monologues for her, like in her voice, just to like see if I could tap into her voice. And like- That's amazing. It's, it's, and I, it, I look back at myself and I'm like proud that I did that. I don't, yeah. know, if I do, I don't know if I'd do that now, but I did it then. Grit. And, you had um, grit. Yeah, I had, I knew, like I had, I knew that I, that I, she and I had some sort of simpatico thing, or at least I hoped we did. Mm -hmm. And 
I also know every joke she's ever told and I've seen her live several times. And, and I, and I was, I, I, so I practiced and then, you know, then, you know, a couple of years later, I'm, I'm at blue collar TV and the show's coming to an end. And I hear that there's an opening at the Ellen show. And I literally dusted off those practice monologues that I wrote for no reason. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, and this I punched reason. them up for this reason. And I, I submitted and, um, and I got the job. Uh, and it was just the, certainly one of those moments in life where I, uh, it was totally life-changing because it was something I really had visualized. You know, and I'm a big believer in visualizing and uh, in, you know, our ability to really manifest the things that we want through just being able to see ourselves doing it. You know, yeah. I know that could sound sort of woo-woo to people, but, you know, visualization, you know, some people call it prayer or, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. or even meditation. It's just, I had such a specific vision of working with Ellen and, you know, somehow I was like able to, to make it, you know, to magnetize it. And, um, and it's, yeah. And, and, and it was, um, it, it was right from the start. I, I, I had been right. We did have sort of like a simpatico thing and she really um, kind of got me and appreciated me and took me under her wing and was incredibly uh, supportive and kind and, you know, really turned me into uh, the writer I am today because she was, you know, she's a perfectionist. She's, mm -hmm. you know, one of the greatest comedians of all time for a reason because yeah. she works at it and right. she doesn't just settle, you know, she, she'll take a monologue that you write for her and she'll circle five jokes and go, you can beat all these, uh. you know, and that's, some people could see that as tough, but I always saw it as a challenge. And I, so I'd run back to my office and try to, you know, beat the jokes and, and, you know, make her happy. And, you know, when I did, it was like no better, no better feeling. Um, and, and it was an incredible experience to work for her. But even that, like at a certain point, I was, I just sort of wanted to keep stretching my writer muscle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause it's like, you know, it's a talk show. You write monologues yeah. about one topic and you maybe write right. like a little joke or something, but you know, it's, it's. But, yeah. bef but before leaving Ellen, uh, you also, won at least four Emmys <laughs> for writing for Ellen. Just throwing that did, in there. I did run, I did win, excuse me, uh, exactly four Emmys. <laughs> sure. Yes, yes uh, I did. Which, you know, not that awards are the be all and end all, but a very great accomplishment that I, I want Thank to you. acknowledge. Um, as you. well as wrote for her for at least two Oscar ceremonies when she was Exactly two. Exactly, exactly yeah. too. My yeah. numbers are really strong this evening. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point that out that then you also got experience writing for the yes. Oscars and, and all kinds of things. And just a quick question, because I feel like some people might be wondering, like on the business end of you writing for Blue Collar and then sort of jumping over to Ellen and that luck again, was that just from a business side, your manager having a great connection to the people at Ellen? I mean, yeah, you know, so it is, it is sort of a multifaceted luck, you know, yeah. it is, it's about, you know, certainly being in the right place at the right time, but also having the right people represent you. Right. Uh, and my manager, Christy Smith, uh, I was her first client. So we started working together when I was 24 and she was 25. We still work together uh, 19 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have grown together, you know, we've evolved in this business together. And for blue collar TV, yeah, she she submitted my material. I didn't have an agent at that time. She submitted it to uh, the producers of blue collar TV because she happened to represent a writer that was leaving the show. Mm -hmm. And um, and then with um, with Ellen, see, this is the sort of tricky, funny thing about about this business is that once I got a job and I was working on blue collar TV, then I got an agent because right. I don't right. know why it works like that, but it does. Right. And so I I I quite literally specifically chose the agent who represented Ellen's head writer because that's how much I wanted to work on Ellen. Wow. So I, I mean, not that I had all these choices, but it but worked still, out that. Right. Yeah. And so we're aware and yeah, you know. Very, I, I, I think the business side, you know, can't be sort of um, for, forgotten or even, you know, I mean, like undersold, you know, right. it is, 
I think, you know, if, if you admire anybody's career in this business, it's probably because there's someone on the managerial or, you know, agent mm-hmm. front, um, you know, behind them who is, who is helping push them forward. And, and yes. I, I certainly have that with Christy. Yes. May we all have a yeah. Christy Smith in our lives. Yes. For many reasons. Yes. Um, okay. So let's, I want to be aware of time as well. Yes. I want to get us more into the path to creator Yes. And um, so what would you like to talk about next in terms of, I know you so wanted you, to, yeah, yeah, honing your voice so, and all that. So, so, you know, like I was saying, working for Ellen was great and I got to hone my, certainly my voice as a joke writer, but I started to really itch to tell stories. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted, you know, I wanted what I was writing to be more than two pages. I yeah. just, you know, I wanted it to have a beginning, middle and end. And I wanted to bring a character on a journey. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do that you know, on a talk show. So I left Ellen and, you know, with her blessing and she was very kind and, you know, um, and, and she knew I was going to, to try to develop my own show. And then the strike hit. Oh yeah. The writer's strike in 2008. And, um, you know, I, I used that time to, first of all, meet lots of writers on, on the picket line and, and in the office, you know, where I answered phones and made banners and things like that. But I also use that time to start thinking about the story I wanted to tell. And you know, by the time we were done with the strike, I had written for no one else, so no one was paying me or anything, but mm-hmm. I had written a spec uh, telling a story uh, about me and my best friend who is a guy um, and, and sort of about our fun and complicated relationship because I'm a gay woman, he's a straight man and um, you know, comedy <laughs> ensues. And, and, and from that script, you know, um, that is actually the script that ended up becoming One Big Happy. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I'm skipping over other jobs and, you know, different things like that. But, you know, once I started to write pilots, I felt like I was really sort of in the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like I do have a, my own voice. You know, it's, it can be a little scary when you write for one person for years, you know, and right. you sort of think like, where's the line between me and that person? But it was it was a really like like awesome discovery to be like oh I, I have my own voice that's, that's thank God <laughs> um, and so um, I was uh, I was in a place where I was able to, to develop a, a pilot for Warner Brothers I had been working on uh, a show called T- uh, Two Broke Girls for many yes. years and um, and which was a really you know fun show to work on lots of lots of uh, blue uh, humor mm-hmm. let's call it. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I can, I know my way around a dick joke, let me tell you. Uh, but anyway, um, so so I took that original pilot that I wrote in 2008 and sort of kind of modernized it and dug into it. And I turned it into a show called One Big Happy. And I was looking for a producer to pair with to sort of make the whole package more interesting because I, nobody really knew who I was. And, you know, I, I wanted to sell this thing. And Ellen, uh, became my producer. Uh, she was really supportive and she's a wonderful um, producer who works with her named Jeff Kleeman and he helped me shepherd this whole thing. And um, when the show got picked up, when the script, you know, got picked up to be produced for pilot, um, you know, at that point is when they usually appoint a showrunner. And I had never been a showrunner. I had been a writer for many, many years at this point on, on shows, on, on Two Broke Girls specifically, where I had risen to the title of co-executive producer, but I hadn't really ever, you know, run my own show. Um, but I had gotten... Quick, just the quickest definition of showrunner for those who so, might... Yeah, no, of course. Showrunner is the, essentially the, the head writer, very often the creator of the show, though not always, who is also the executive producer of the show. So the person who sees the show from idea to script, to production, to editing, to final picture. Mm -hmm. So as the showrunner, you're in charge of all of that. You are sort of the CEO of the show. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is a a very challenging job and uh, a, a very sort of scary one to throw yourself into, but I really wanted to do it. And I had been given a lot of encouragement by the showrunner of Two Broke Girls, Michael mm-hmm. Patrick King, who, you know, after sort of working with me and observing me was like, I, you, you can do it. Mm-hmm. And so with that, and also I had just read the book right. Lean In by mm-hmm. Sheryl Sandberg. 
um, which I highly recommend if you need a little boost. Um, I said to Jeff Gleeman and to Ellen, I want to be the showrunner. Like, I know that you could easily find somebody who's got a lot more experience, but like, this is my story. And, and I, I think, I think I can do it. And they went to bat for me and they did let me become the showrunner of the pilot, which was a little bit of like a test, you know, to see if uh -huh. I could do it and how, how well, and um, kind of miraculously the show ended up getting picked up and I became the showrunner of the show, which was my first experience um, doing that in that role and really learning on the job, which is really challenging. It was a very much a fake it till you make it kind of situation. A um, lot of fake in it, a little bit of making it. But so, um, so much making it, so much making it. I witnessed, I went to tapings. You were great. <laughs> Not that the tapings yeah. is all it's about, but. But those are fun. You, you really looked like you had confidence and knew what you were doing. Well, I'm bossy and I'm controlling. So those two <laughs> sure. qualities evidently really lend themselves to the role of showrunner. Um, you know, I, I think um, I, I weirdly am suited to the job, though though it is every day a huge challenge, like no matter what you're doing. Um, and what I'll just quickly say about that experience of doing One Big Happy, which was a very sort of, I mean, a relatively high concept relationship show on a network with a lesbian lead character, which doesn't seem like it should have been so far ahead of its time only six years ago, but it was. And, right. you know, I, I was really trying for something. And I think ultimately, you know, it was, it was uh, not a perfect fit for network television. And, you know, it was heartbreaking when they canceled it. And I had to sort of bury myself in a hole for a little bit and grieve that loss. Um, and, you know, I, I think I started to realize like maybe the kind of stories I want to tell aren't best suited to network television. Maybe I, I do want to tell more complicated stories that don't fit into that 21 and a half minute mold that you have to squeeze your show into when you do a, a comedy on network TV, because that's what right. it is. It's 21 and a half minutes, which is really hard to do well. Yeah. And my hat's off to anybody who does that well, and there are many. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, so uh, I um this was a sort of a weird uh, part of the story, but it's true in that um, I'm cutting ahead several years now, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, around the time that I turned 40, I was going, this was a few years ago, um, I do have the filter on my Zoom <laughs> that makes me look a little younger, so. You're timeless. Oh. You're sweet. Um, so um, I, you will, you remember, I had this great party for my 40th birthday, super fun. Hell and of hell of a night, so fun. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately I found out the next morning that on the day of my 40th birthday, my cousin had passed away unexpected, uh, unexpectedly of a heart attack and he, he was 50. And uh, I was also going through a lot of my own uh, sort of fertility struggles at the time. My wife and I had been trying to have a baby at that point for like, you know, four years, five years. And I was in a very specific place. I was yeah. in a place of grief and, you know, loss. I had also lost a good friend um, the previous year. And, you know, I, it, I was sort of struggling to make sense of this sort of hard moment that I was in. And around that time, um, I was set up on a, on a pitch meeting because you gotta keep working. <laughs> and, um, and I was told, I don't have to have anything prepared. Just go into this meeting. They're looking to develop a show, a comedy for two women. They have a lot of ideas to show up and you know, if something, you know, something connects, that's great, but really no pressure. And that's I was like, so okay. <laughs> I mean, you you were seasoned at that point, but that feels like terrifying. They're like, "Don't worry, just show up and." Yeah, you know, I mean, yes, I've been, I've done so many of these at this point, but also that background as an improviser really mm. comes in handy. Yeah, and it really came in handy in this meeting, um, and you'll you'll see why. Because so what happened was I sat down. It was five o'clock. I was clearly the last person, you know, of the day because you can tell because like there's a fruit plate, but only the honeydew <laughs> is left. You know, you just have that feeling. 
you know, like there's like Nobody lots of seltzers, it. but none of the good flavors. So <laughs> you're just like, this is, there were a lot of people here before me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sat down and, you know, in this state that I was in, and the first thing out of their mouth was, you know what, we're sick of our ideas. Do you have any? Goodness. And I really, truly like didn't. And when mm -hmm. I, I'm not like being modest and like cute right. and like really I had something in my back pocket. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah the, these pockets were empty. There was nothing <laughs> there. And uh, this, actually my jeans had no pockets. That's how <laughs> detached I was from an idealist idea. you were. I was totally idealist. And so I just was like, okay, well, here we go. I'm gonna mm -hmm. start stalling. I'm gonna ask them questions. And I could tell that they were looking for something like a little bit dark and, you know, they didn't want it to be network, which I was really relieved about. And truly like an idea popped into my head as if from the ether, I had never thought about it before. And I just said, uh, one of them's a widow and uh, she goes to a grief group and she meets the other one, but only her, her guy didn't die. He just broke up with her. And then they become friends and then she finds out that she was like, and you know, and they figure, and I just was like, I don't even know what I was saying. I really truly don't. And, and, it, and they were just like sort of listening. And when I was done, I'll never forget it. Cause one of them just looked at me and she was like, I like you. <laughs> I was like, well, good. Because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, this is a I, great I started, Hollywood story. It's like one of those, uh, yeah. I, I wish I was, I'm not exaggerating an iota either. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and I'm even leaving things out. Cause I, I, by the way, I literally also was sick that day. I had been on an IV of vitamins <laughs> and went to that meeting. And then when I got home, I took my temperature and I had a fever. I had like a hundred degree fever. So it was my Lime. fever pitch. <laughs> Da, da, da. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that is obviously, um, you know, for those of you who have seen Dead to Me, that I ended up developing into Dead to Me. And, and just as like sort of a show of, um, you know, why tenacity is so important, I developed that particular idea for those producers for months. I had wow. the whole thing worked out. The pilot, as you've seen it, the first, you know, season, the, the, what the arc could be for the whole show, all the characters, and they passed on it. They were like, wow. no, these producers yeah, we don't. Yeah. They just yeah. like, it, they, they didn't feel like it was the right fit, you know, and they're wow. lovely people, but yeah. that, you know, and I was like, well, shit, like I right. just spent all this time and kind of like all my energy developing this idea. I have to like, at least see if, you know, the people I'm working with will, will want to do it. And I'm really lucky in that I had a contract with CBS studios. Um, you know, who like sort of like, you know, a first look kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they're gonna think I'm insane. I'm taking this weird idea about a widow and it's really dark. And they think I'm like a sitcom jokey, you know, uh, right. broad comedy writer. They're gonna like, they're gonna fire me. <laughs> but instead I pitched them the show and I kind of took them through the pilot and they immediately were like, we're gonna take this everywhere. This is not a network show. Like, you know, wow. and, 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 um, the rest is dead right. to me. And <laughs> that's fantastic. And <laughs> and just to clarify, this was CBS Studios, which is different than the network. So CBS yeah. Studios is, yeah, takes right. out all, all the networks, different networks. Yeah, all networks yeah. sort of have their own sort of home studios that are allowed to intermingle. Wow, okay. So um, before we jump into some questions, so that is dead to me. And now you are work currently working on season three. You are of course the showrunner, creator all around, you know, head honcho of Dead to Me. You're currently writing season three. That's right. You are hoping- If you could see my desk, it is, <laughs> right. it is like, it is like a, like season three, like I ate season three and then I threw it up <laughs> on my desk. <laughs> Amazing. And you are hoping to shoot that, uh, Early next year. Early next year, COVID dependent. COVID willing, yes. Yes. And um, yeah, anything else? Uh, obviously, it's a brilliant show. When when you okay. let me read the pilot, I believe I just texted you something like, that was the greatest pilot I've ever read. And I've read a fair amount of pilots in my time here, and it, it, it truly was. Thank and you. Um, it was also completely surprising, the end of it. I won't give it away. Uh, it was amazing. And um, so 
congrats on all of that. And now you are working on season three. And I know that there are many other projects that will be will be grateful to see in all the years to come. Yeah, I mean, I have, I, I do have other ideas and, and uh, it's a little daunting to think about, you know, developing a whole new thing, but it is also exciting. Um, right. And, uh, but I mean, what I will say is like, though I never really set out to create Dead to Me, obviously um, it has completely changed my life in the mm -hmm. most like profound way on so many levels. Um, and so much of that is because it wasn't something I created to kind of just be like, all right, I got to sell something, you know? Yeah, like yeah. A lot of times I, you know, like as, a, as especially, and I think if there are any writers out there, you'll understand TV writers, like, you know, every season, like you have an opportunity, all right, you can make some money if you sell a pilot, but you don't right. necessarily think about what's the story that you're dying to tell. You think, what can I sell? Yeah. You know, what will somebody buy? And this, I really just, it came from some sort of deep, dark place. Um, and I really, for the first time, allowed myself to tell a story that was reflective of, of where I was at emotionally. And, and, you know, I allowed myself to be vulnerable and, you know, to, to go to some really dark places. And um, it was this idea that I couldn't let go of, even though nobody was like, obviously those producers were like past. Um, mm -hmm. But I was something inside of me was like, just try, just this, this could be good, like try yeah. this. And, you know, I think we have to follow those positive voices sometimes, like those notions that we get, that nagging thing that's like, I should do that thing. Like, don't ignore that. That's, right. that's a powerful sort of, in some ways, almost all knowing voice that we really should listen to more often. Amen. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. You're welcome. Let us, uh, let us open a few questions. We have okay. several. Um, Great. Great. Okay. So Grace asks, when you have a vision, how do you go about making sure your vision is executed how you want it to be? That's a great question. Um, well, I think that is essentially the role of the showrunner, yeah. you know, is to not only have the vision, which isn't always easy to have, you know, but like, for example, in the case of Dead to Me, this was really coming from a pretty deep place. And I, I needed to express this. I needed to start talking about my grief and, and the experience of the kind of loss that, um, you know, isn't necessarily defined in the way that we're used to, you know. Um, and I had a very specific vision. And the way in which you carry that out is to hire people that are on the same same wavelength as you, you know. I sat down with several directors, and I waited for the one who said the things that resonated with me. You know, she saw the same kind of references in my pilot that I saw. You know, we we both agreed like we wanted to look a certain way, and you know, we it, it was it was sort of a, a simpatico moment. And then I sat with the director of photographer, you know, the cinematographer, and he used the same references, unbeknownst to us. You yeah. know. Um, uh, for example, we were talking a lot about the movie American Beauty and the way it was shot and how composed and beautiful the frames were. I really wanted something like that. I knew that. I knew I didn't want it to look like lots of other TV shows with the sort of shaky cam, you know, close to the, mm -hmm. I, I wanted it to feel very composed and almost a little removed and lonely. And people started to pick up on that and they saw it too. And, um, you know, and that's a really like, you know, when somebody's on your wave wavelength and, and, you know, as a showrunner, I get to pick who, who comes on board. I hire those people mm -hmm. and, you know, you hire the writers, you hire writers, you, you read their scripts and you go, is there, is there something in the script that translates to the kind of stories I want to tell is the way they write, you know, in the same sort of world that, you know, that I write in and, um, you know, you have to sort of always sort of fine you know, fine tune that vision. You have to be really in touch with yourself and you have to be unafraid to be unwavering in, mm -hmm. in that vision. Right. You know, and you've also mentioned to me that that Netflix is also very supportive of your vision. They're incredible. I mean, I have to say, like having had a, a multitude of experiences of, of platform, well, net, networks primarily, um, but studios as well, like you know, they really, they don't just sort of pick up a show, they sort of pick up the person, 
-hmm. and they really they really get behind you know you as the creator um or at least i should say they've gotten behind me as the creator you know that it's been my experience and they've been incredibly supportive and look this is a weird show like when i first wrote the pilot of dead to me people were like what is the tone like what is this like can you tell us pick another show and i couldn't because mm -hmm. it was very specific to the way i look at the world it was like it was it was it was my own tone and and it's very hard to express that without just sort of showing it but right. they trusted me you know and and i hired actresses who i felt like could sort of embody that tone and my god have they i'm so lucky to have christina That's applegate right. and linda cardellini and james marsden um and uh you know and and you there's a lot of sort of self trust that needs to happen which is really can be really challenging and um, you know, you just sort of, you sort of just have to jump and know that you're your own parachute. Right. I love how, I love it. Um, okay, so Jenny asks, any advice on how to get your foot in the door and or get representation when writing for TV is a career change? Thanks from a commercial producer looking to transition to scripted. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that's a tough one. And, and I'll be honest, like, you know, I, I am so many years out from that experience. And, um, you know, the, the best thing I can say is whatever you're writing to sub hopefully submit to somebody, make that the best thing you have ever written. And yeah. if you haven't rewritten it at least 10 times, you probably haven't worked hard enough on it. Okay. You know, there's, um, nothing is perfect and nothing will ever be perfect but especially pilots take honing you know original pilots take discipline and and they take a they take layers you know even in the way we write dead to me it's it's never just the first draft that you're seeing you're seeing the 20th draft you know each time we go back in we make it better we add a layer we add texture we add a metaphor we add a you know symbolism and i would just say that I've seen a lot of um, sort of young or, you know, new writers coming up thinking that like their script is great and that should get them the thing. Well, there's, you know, thousands of people who think their scripts are great. Make sure yours pops off the page, give it to friends to read, take their notes seriously. If everybody is giving you the same note, take it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, um, it is about honing your craft nobody starts out being an amazing writer. You know, right. it's that Malcolm Gladwell theory of 10,000 hours thing. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's great to want to do it, but first do it really well. Yep. Yeah. Well, to, to that point, um, there are a couple other questions here that I, that are sort of related to that in that um, Casey asks, what are your thoughts on writing sketches for YouTube? And also Trisha asks, what's your take on fiction podcasts as a sample of your work? So I know things are changing these days where you can kind of be discovered doing different things, but do you feel like there's still sort of a standard, you're gonna have to have this in your arsenal or? or yeah, no? I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but like, <laughs> you know, I, I don't understand how a fiction podcast is going to I'm not sure what that person wants to ultimately do but mm -hmm. whatever you're if you want to work in television if you want to make a show it has to start on the page mm -hmm. and so you know and then I think the other uh person's uh, question sketches, was about ske sketches for YouTube I mean I think it's great I think honestly you know it so much of doing it, so much of like you know here's how I'll put it. I know a lot of people who talk about being writers. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who are in the practice of trying to be a writer. Right. A writer writes. Right. You know, a writer mm -hmm. writes, a creator creates. If you want, if, if what you want to do is sketch comedy, then tomorrow start writing those sketches and the next day shoot them. You know, mm -hmm. I'm abbreviating time, but you know what I mean? Like, do it, go do it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and listen, it's also fine to be a person who talks about writing and it's fine to be a person who talks about directing and, and, and sometimes there's joy in just the longing of wanting to do it. But if you really want to do it, do it. Right. You know, I mean, uh, there's no substitute 
uh, for a, an incredibly well-written script. You know, cream does rise to the top. Talent does find its way, you know, to being seen and recognized. If it's good, people will notice. Amen. Um, so talk about, let's see, how does your writing experience help in the pitch process? So, well, you know, it's funny. We, yeah. Okay. I think kind of, I understand the question. Yeah. You sort of talked about how your improv experience helped in the, in the pitch process. I guess maybe that's about like, whatever you have to prepare, you know, I'm not sure, How, however you would. Well, here, here's what I, here's the advice I would give about pitching. Um, pitching to me is a mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's, you know, it's short mm -hmm. for sales pitch, right. you know, and, and a, and a good salesman is a good performer. And I definitely rely on my performing background and my improvising background, but also my joke writing background to, to make sure that whatever this idea is that I'm putting forward, that the way in which I'm putting it forward is entertaining in and of itself. Right. That the pitch itself is riveting and interesting and surprising and funny. Um, if that's what your show is, that's what your pitch should be. If mm. you're pitching a comedy, your pitch should be funny. Mm -hmm. You should carve out little jokes for yourself to make in there or for the characters to make or, you know. Uh, that's little great side comments. Oh yeah. If you're, if you're pitching a thriller, there should better be some surprises in that pitch. You should wear you know, a costume. You should wear a costume, <laughs> perhaps like uh, the Phantom of the Opera half mask <laughs> for effect. That'll um, work, that'll work. Don't do but, that. You know, think about the people you're pitching to. They sit there hour after hour yeah. after pitch. And you know, a lot of people who go in there and pitch are not, are not performers. They're not thinking of it in that way. And I think I've been successful in some part because I use always use that platform as a chance to entertain. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, as a writer, as a showrunner, you're an entertainer. You might be the person behind the camera, but everything's coming from you. And so if they feel like, oh shit, she's she's funny, she's entertaining. I yeah. like the way she spins a yarn, you know, right. they're then much they're more likely want. to want to work with you. Amazing. Great. Um, so Jessica asks, how are Christina Applegate and Linda Cardellini cast in the lead roles? I think their chemistry is amazing and love seeing them together. Also super appreciate seeing women who are not perfect 25 year olds in close up shots. <laughs> Me too. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so Christina and Linda, um, you know, were cast in what we call an offer only situation. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, for very experienced, you know, uh, very often, you know, big stars, famous people, um, you know, they won't, they won't audition. They don't, they don't they're not going to like come in and like read from your script and right. wait for you to judge them. Uh, no, they're smarter than that. They, you have to make them an offer first. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I did not write the parts for them. I, I, um, you know, I actually had other actresses in mind who I'll never name, but you know, <laughs> it's always helpful for me to have an actress or actor in mind when I'm writing a part. Um, and, you know, truly when I, I sat down with our casting directors for the, on the very first day, the very first name they brought up to play Jen was Christina. And I had very randomly been developing another show for her, uh, really kind of, uh, simultaneously to dead to me. It was a really different show. It was set in the world of politics. We ended up both sort of thinking, you know what, in it was early, sort of early Trump years, didn't feel like politics was really what people wanted to watch at that point. Um, and and so we we sort of dissolved that project, but that was only a few months before now, our cast directors for Dead to Me are like, what about Christina Applegate? And, you know, there's that moment of recognition sometimes that happens mm -hmm. when, you know, somebody mentions a name and like they said, and I was like, of course. And it, and it was another moment where it was just like, of course, these of course, are supposed of to get course. it. Yeah. Of course, oh, we weren't supposed to do that together. We're supposed right. to do this together. And she's, per I, when I thought about it, I was like, oh my God, it's her. Like, she's perfect for this part. So we cast Christina first and, you know, she was reluctant to come back to TV. It wasn't an immediate yes from her. You know, I sort of had to go yeah. and tell her why this would be perfect for her. And then once we had her cast, um, it was actually one of um, my amazing uh, partners at Netflix, Kristen Zollner, I believe, who said, what about Linda Cardellini for, for Judy? 
And it's funny because, you know, when, when you're making a pilot, you have these lists, these really long lists of actors that, you know, uh, that are sort of in each character's column. And I love Linda Cardellini, but I thought of her kind of more as like a dark dramatic actress. So we actually had her in the Jen column. You know, she was somebody we were considering. Um, but then, you know, we, we obviously we went with Christina and when they said Linda, I was like, hmm, I mean, that's, I could sort of see them together. And th I met with Linda and it was like, it was like, we were like, it was like an instant connection. It was like, we were, you know, it was like one of my old friends and she just had such a great, lovely, you know, just immediately uh, endearing energy. And I knew that Judy had to be a very likable character that had to be sort of an undeniably lovely person to be able to forgive certain things that happen. And, um, and so we cast them both before they ever met, Ugh. which is really scary. But, uh, you know, upon their first meeting, it was sort of like an instant chemistry and we all sort of exhaled and um, yeah, but it's, I'm, I'm again, super lucky. They just really have incredible chemistry and love each other. Yes, yes, they do. Um, so there were a couple of questions about your process. So I'm just gonna put it together and we only have a few minutes left. So we'll try to get in a few more, um, but uh, quickly, those two questions are, Kristen asked, when you sit to write new ideas, what is your process? Do you dive right into story or do you do a lot of character development and backstory work first? And then Lisa asked, what does your creative process for writing look like? <laughs> Do you keep a journal to scribble down ideas, et cetera? So sort of like, what do you, where are like, you writing yeah. things down and, and, oh, and God. what's the order? <laughs> uh-huh. Like this is, yeah, I mean, I'm very disorganized. Um, this is, I feel like this is gonna no. be a disappointing answer, you guys, but- um, No, I mean, um, it works. So, so it works, yeah. Okay, well, you know, here's the truth. When, when I come up with an idea, it is quite often, as if it sort of drops in. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm never like, I need to come up with an idea. I have to come up with an idea. I'm gonna sit at my desk and I'm gonna come up with, that doesn't work for me. That, yeah. that maybe works for some people, but I can't sort of do it in a vacuum in that way. Uh, very often it is in the most random place at the weirdest time, not when I'm supposed to be thinking of something, um, generally on an off hour um, and you know, that, that dead to me example is like the weirdest. I mean, that's like never happened to me before. Probably will never happen to me again. Um, but what I will say is I came up with that idea in that room uh -huh. and I just started to think about it. My process is to do a lot of thinking. I just start to let it start to live in my brain, you know, and, and let my sort of imagination like start to take hold of it. And I like to think, you know, like, I, I almost don't think, it's almost essentially the absence of, I just let it live there. And generally things will start to come, you know, it, it's, it's a very unforced process that works for me. Um, sometimes somebody will say something and it'll, and I'll go, oh my God, yeah. Like I was watching The Crown last night. And it's set in, you know, it's like a period piece, you know, set in, you know, British, the British monarchy. And it gave me an idea for something a character could say in one of the scenes on Dead to Me that is like completely unrelated. I don't know why it just worked that way. Right. So I let it really just live in my brain for a, a long time before I ever write it down. Sometimes months before I ever write it down. And I'll start to talk about it. Usually uh, my wife is the first person I'll tell. I'll go, how did I That's an idea. I was thinking about it, thing, something like that. And, you know, I you use her as like sort of my first barometer. And, you know, and she's a really good barometer. And she'll be like, I like that. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then I'll usually tell Christy, my manager, I'll call her. If I, I get really excited and I call her. And pretty much right away, I know if it's good or bad by her reaction. Uh -huh, uh -huh. She starts going like, oh, that's really interesting. And <laughs> she starts asking me lots of like critical questions. Like, well, why? And I'm like, okay, all right, I'm gonna let that one pass. Right, but, right, right. Uh, yeah, so I just, I, I really like, I, I put a, I, I try to remove all the pressure and just sort of let it start to live. And um, more often than not, it just sort of starts to seed and grow and limbs branch out and it gets to the place where eventually I'll write it down 
in kind of a stream of consciousness way where I, I, I try not to like, I, I'm not an organized person as Faye can tell you, she is, <laughs> has been my organizer in the past. <laughs> I'm, I'm deeply disordered, I'm scattered and I let myself be scattered. So instead of going, well, here's my column for characters and here's my column for story. I just go mm, something like that. Yeah. And, you know, and then I work from there. Right. And you also have the, the training and experience to then sort of know the structure to then funnel it into yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, as yeah. the it process gets, goes along. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It gets, right. it gets organized at a certain point. Um, right. And I, and I, yes, I do know how to do that stuff, but in terms of like, for me, the idea is my favorite thing. Yeah. That, that those moments, those weeks or months where it's just living in my head, I have one right now living in my head. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like having like, it's like, it's like having like a creative affair, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like having like, a, like a fun secret that I get to sort of think about, you know, whenever I want. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, well, it, if if you'll answer one more question I thought sure. would be good here um, uh, related to the pandemic and I think related to artists in, in, in general, um, but Gretchen asked during this pandemic, a lot of us have had more time to write, but at times it's been hard to find motivation. So is there any advice for pushing through and writing even when it feels hard and overwhelming? Gretchen, girl, mm -hmm. I get it. I, I get really it, so. get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel that one. Um, you know, I mean, listen, that's a question I've asked myself in this time. And I think it depends on what your capacity is in the moment, you know, in terms of how to answer that. Um, you know, I'm motivated by fear, uh, truly. I joke, but it's really, I mean, I am. I'm, I'm very motivated by fear. Um, and for me, I, I don't have a choice. You know, I have to write a season three. It, if I'm not yeah. running that ship, it's not getting written. If I don't write it, we'll not have anything to shoot in, in you know, early next year, COVID willing. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I would say, on the one hand, like, forgive yourself <laughs> if you don't feel motivated. It's a really hard time. Um, certainly if I didn't have, you know, a, a, a company and a deadline, platform or, yeah. and a deadline and hundreds of people and then, you know, millions of viewers waiting for this thing, I don't think I would get anything done. But, you know, I have a proverbial gun to my head. I, I have to do it. Um, and sometimes it's a slog, man. I'm just sitting there and I don't want to do it. And I feel unmotivated and I feel sad. And, and you know, just like, you know, in the same existential weirdness that we're all in, I just have to do it. So I power through. Um, and if you want to power through, give yourself a deadline, give yourself an artificial deadline or make it real, you know, make a, a friend that you really admire, a writer you like to work with, a former boss, somebody and go, hey, I'm going to tell you right now, I have to send you this script by January 5th. Yep, exactly. I have to. Right. And if, and if I don't, make me feel bad, <laughs> you know, like yeah. seriously, hold me to it. Um, you know, I do that with Christy, my manager, sometimes if I don't have a full deadline, I, you know, I go, I'm going to give this to you by next Thursday. And she's like, okay. You know, uh -huh. and, and um, you know, it really, really helps to, to, to have, unfortunately, external pressure. Um, yeah. But I, I don't think there's, a, I don't believe, I can never sort of believe any artist, writer, anything, who anybody who in a time like this is just like, I'm just so prolific. I can't, like, it's really right. hard. We're all yeah. in mud, you know, and, um, and I, feel, I feel for all of us that we have to even try. But I will say that having to try and having these deadlines like in, in, in a lot of ways has been really soul saving for me because it's giving me something to put my you know, heart and feelings and all of this angst into. So if you can find that motivation right. or that external pressure, do it because it does ultimately feel good. Oh, that's a wonderful answer. I'm like, I'm <laughs> feeling that answer and all of that as an artist <laughs> myself who has not been playing this old thing as much as she, she should during the pandemic. So I can 
relate and it's fine. It's, it's going to be, there's okay. no shoulds in a pandemic. Exactly. The fact that we're there's just no here shoulds in a pandemic. that we all showed up tonight, like that's a win. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I really, I think we have to be really gentle with ourselves in this time. Like treat yourself like you're your own child in a way. Yeah. Like it's hard. We're going through a crazy thing and we're all doing it together. So I don't think there's anybody like out there that wouldn't understand that you're maybe in a slower plate. You know, it's like, yeah. we get it. We, we all get it. Absolutely. Uh, well, that's great. Um, thank you for the questions. There were so many great ones. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to all of them. Liz, you've been brilliant answering all thank of these. You. And thank um, you so much I, for moderating, Faye. I love oh you. Oh my goodness. I love you. I love you. This is a dream. And thank you, of course, for sharing all your wisdom. And again, everyone who has showed up and asked a question, we really appreciate it, whether you asked a question or not. Um, thank you for being here. And we'd also like to thank everyone else who has joined us today. And a special thanks to our many donors for supporting BU and programs like this. For more information about the many fantastic online events coming soon, there are so many, I get the emails, they're just amazing, amazing events. Uh, please visit bu.edu slash alumni slash events. And you can also find many fantastic career resources on the BU alumni website by visiting bu.edu slash alumni slash careers. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Liz, and everyone have a good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks.